yeah so please um do just say hello let me know where you're from where you're calling from uh, i've got so we've got some good ones here as well already and uh, we've got people from rochester seattle ohio valencia lincoln nebraska very nice <clears throat> i'm based in the uk um so it's a bit later for me than it is for a lot of you okay right it is time so let's get started um so welcome everybody i think people are still um coming in but i'm going to get started because i like starting on time um and people can just pour in as we go so welcome to this webinar about nine writing roadblocks and how to overcome them. And it is co-sponsored by uh, me, Katia Kane, from the Novel Factory and Book Baby, represented by Ramona, who will be saying a little bit later. Um, so thank you so much for um, coming. And I hope that I will be able to share some tips and insights that will help you move forward and get, le get stuck less often uh, for less time when you're writing your novel. Um, yeah, so like I say, please um, do say hello to me in the Q&A. It's nice to hear people's names, where you're from, um, and even a little bit about what you're writing, either the genre or, you know, feel free to give me a little pitch as well. I do like reading those. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you have access to reactions. I'm not sure. But if you do, feel free to uh, go ahead and use them because it's always lovely to get feedback on which things are landing, which things are resonating. Um, so first, let me tell you a little bit about me. Uh, so uh, as I said, my name is Katia Kane and I have been writing with the aim to be published for the past 13 years or so. Here are some of my achievements over that time, oldest at the bottom, moving upwards. Um, so over the last 13 years, I have written about a dozen novels, um, read, so many books are on the craft of writing and I have received hundreds of rejections, but I am pleased to say that my perseverance paid off because this year I was offered a major deal with one of the biggest publishers in the world, Penguin Random House. Um, so I am very excited about that. Uh, and my young adult fantasy novel, Blood of Gods and Girls, is due to be published in early 2026. So if you'd like to uh, keep be kept in the loop for that, please do get in touch with me uh, on Twitter or email or uh, however. So while I was pursuing my dream of becoming an author, I also created a software app called The Novel Factory. Uh, I created The Novel Factory because I wanted an app that would make me more efficient, uh, taking care of the boring bits so that I could focus my energy on the fun, creative stuff. And after I built it, I thought I would share it with the world in case it was useful for others too. So it has tons of useful tools for pinning down your premise, plotting, creating characters and keeping track of your progress with cool uh, graphs that automatically update in nice colors and show you, you know, your line for like what you want to do and then the other line, which is kind of like hopefully following it somewhat. Um, and I basically designed it to help me get over many of the roadblocks I was experiencing. So I will say a little bit more about the software at the end. Um, but if you would like to learn more about the Novel Factory, you can also visit our website at novel-software.com. So uh, I am joined uh, in presenting this webinar by Ramona, uh, who's representing Book Baby. So I'm just going to hand over to her for a few minutes so she can say a few words about herself and Book Baby. Hi, everybody. I'm Ramona Pina. I work at uh, Book Baby, which is an independent publishing company. I'm also, like many of you all, and Katya, a creative. So I, I like to write fantasy myself. So I'm excited to be here um, in that regard. But uh, I've been a publishing specialist here for almost seven years, working with uh, authors at different stages, so I really help guide them on the different options of how to approach their book, and we'll talk more about that um, later on, right, Katya? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, during these past 13 years, I have made every mistake, hit a huge number of barriers, tripped over many hazards, and as I said, I've also read a ton of books on writing, and I've learned a great deal about the psychology of creativity and the way our minds work. So I've tried to bring as much of that together as I can into this webinar. Um, 
to address some of the most common roadblocks writers face and to give you some tools to push past them, leap over them, or simply step right around them. So obviously not everything will be relevant to everyone, but I'm confident that you will find some useful nuggets or advice. And there should be time for some questions at the end. So uh, if you have something in your mind that I don't cover, please do go ahead and ask, and I will try to get through as many of those as possible. Uh, and we'll direct them to me or Ramona, uh, depending on what we think is, you know, most who's most uh, qualified to answer the question. Um, so I think I just saw a note that Tim has uh, activated the chat now, so you should be able to chat to each other there, hopefully. Uh, and you can also enter your questions in the Q&A. I won't probably answer them as I'm going along, but uh, I will get to them at the end. Um, if we do run out of time to answer your question, then please do go ahead and contact me via the Novel Factory team or on Twitter, and I'm sure we'll be able to get in touch with Book Baby as well. Um, and we will do our best to answer any questions you have. And there will also be a recording sent out of this webinar in a few days. Um, so if you've just missed something, you should be able to check that and see if it might help. Uh, so let's get started. Um, so the first roadblock uh, is getting started. Uh, the horror of the blank page. So for many people, um, <clears throat> the hardest and certainly the first obstacle they come across is how to get started. After all, how do you turn a blank page into 80,000 words on average of gripping story, including character development, plot twists, foreshadowing and a thrilling climax? Where do you start? Should you start by creating a rough outline of the whole story? Or maybe you should flesh out all of your characters, make sure you've really got to know them before bringing them to life. Then again, maybe it would be better to just start writing the first page of the book and see where that takes you. Well, of course, there's no single answer to how is it best to start a novel because everyone will do it differently and everyone will find different techniques effective. On that note, uh, I'm just going to say something quickly about planners and pantsers. You may have heard of the terms planner and pantser, but in case you haven't, <clears throat> a planner uh, is someone who likes to plan every aspect of their novel before getting started, whereas a pantser is someone who doesn't like to do any planning and prefers to just start writing the story and see where it takes them. So there are advantages and disadvantages to both. And I would also say there are highly successful authors who are both types or either type. So planning means that you have some sense of where you're going. So you're less likely to waste time writing yourself into a corner or writing something which meanders off. However, writing straight from your heart or from your subconscious can feel more exciting as there are so many unknowns and that can come across in the writing and make for a less predictable story. One thing to bear in mind is that neither of these methods necessarily reduce the amount of work. They just change where it's stacked. So if you do a lot of planning, then you end up doing a lot of work before you start writing your first draft. However, your first draft is likely to be a lot tighter than if you hadn't planned anything. So the editing process should be quicker. Whereas, if you just start writing, then you're not doing any work up front, but it is very likely you'll have to do a lot more editing in the later stages, carving and sculpting your raw novel into shape. If you are a committed pantser, which is sometimes called a discovery writer, then you're probably not asking yourself this question of where to start in the first place because you're happy to just start writing. But although people are fans of uh, putting people into two separate groups, the fact is that most of us are somewhere in the middle of this spectrum and nobody is fully a planner or fully a pantser. We, we have elements of both. And I think that is the key to how to get started with a novel. Uh, so to get both the best of both worlds, personally, <clears throat> I am a natural planner and I used to do eye-watering amounts of planning before even writing a single word. I mean, some people would be horrified by the amount of words I had written before I wrote any drafts. However, 
Over time, I have understood the appeal of writing more from instinct. Uh, so these days, while I do still do a lot of planning because I can't help myself and I just really want to do it, um, I do try to limit what I do up front uh, and I try to get into the writing process a lot sooner and come back and do some of that planning and research afterwards. So uh, my advice, I'm just going to share my screen again. Uh, goes like this. If you're not sure how to start, so, you know, everything on this, you have to just take it as a, a jumping point and make it uh, suit you. But this is my advice for someone who really just isn't sure. First, I think it is a good idea to figure out your premise or your core start story idea, the heart of the story. What is it about? What are you trying to say with this story? Um, it doesn't have to follow specific rules about um, premises. If you use the Novel Factory resources, you might know that we uh, recommend a, a five point premise. So it's a setting, character, objective, obstacle, disaster. And if you get all of those five elements, then you have a really good like basis for your story. But it doesn't have to be that. It could be a what if uh, question or it could be just um a particular character that you're just dying to explore but you know with it with a goal I think um so but it is good to know what the heart of your story is then I think it's good to pin down your key story beats so there are uh beats that have been recognized to be common across a lot of successful stories um not all stories have all of them uh, and there are a few different uh, interpretations of those beats. But if you study story structure, you will generally find that uh, similar structures are uh, all of the structures are very similar to each other and like uh, have the same kind of uh, beats. So uh, they could be as simple as your opening, your inciting incident, something happens. Uh, and then the climax, I guess, would be like the minimum. But you you can increase on that to have maybe seven or nine key beats, which would then include uh, the midpoint, rock bottom. Uh, those are the key ones that I will always want to have in my stories. And, I, and you will probably feel weird if you read a story and they don't have those elements. Generally, not always. So I think it's really good to pin down roughly what you want those key story beats to be. Now, I think it's fine if you just do that and you're just itching to start writing, then you start writing at that point with chapter one. However, if you still feel like you need a little bit more, which I would personally, what I would do next is to expand those key beats into an extended synopsis. So that's about four to 10 pages expanding on each of those beats. So you just like free flow writing, what's gonna happen then, what's gonna happen then, that kind of thing. And also keep in mind with this that you're not committed to it. This is just to get you started. This is just to like get the story flowing. Anything you want to change later, you can. So it mustn't feel like it's a rigid cage that then you're like committed to. Uh, then I would split the synopsis into scenes roughly. And then I would start writing the first scene. And then I would just repeat it for each of the scenes until I had a first draft, which makes it sound way easier than it is. But that's like a basic um, way that I would get started uh, on writing the novel. Um, and I think that using this rough method means that you avoid a lot of the time that's wasted if you have no idea where the story is going at all. But it is loose enough that there's still plenty of discovery going on as you write. Um, uh, as I said earlier, you should take of this what you find useful and discard the rest. And I'd like to add that writing is very personal and learning what works for you is a key part of learning your craft. Uh, OK, if you do find that rough method useful, you might want to check out uh, my novel writing roadmap. Um, because if you see along the side, it basically gives you 15 steps to take you all the way through your writing um, your novel. Um, but I'll mention that a bit more later on. OK. So, obstacle two, not enough time. I bet this one reson resonates with a lot of you. Uh, so the fact is that most writers don't have the luxury of uh, being able to dedicate themselves full time to striving towards their goal of being a published author. 
The vast majority of us have other commitments, mostly revolving around work and family. But there may be other things. Many of us are exhausted and find it hard to squeeze in any writing time. So what is the answer? Well, there's no easy answer and everybody's situation will be different and some of these things will be harder to do than others. But the first thing I would suggest is that you must mentally commit. Writing a novel is hard. It takes a lot of perseverance, patience and hard work. So if you really want to write a novel, you need to understand that and choose that it's still something you want to do. If you just think it might be a nice idea to write a novel one day, but there's a lot of other things you would like to do, or if you go off the idea when someone says you're going to have to put hundreds of hours, hours into it, then you're going to struggle to hit the distant finish line. But if you really, really do want to write a novel, then get that intention really clear in your head. Write it down on a post-it note and leave it by the computer. Tell people you're going to write a novel. Set a serious intention. Next, create a daily writing habit. This is absolutely key. So everyone's circumstances will be different, but my strong advice is to work hard to create a daily writing habit. And to clarify, I don't mean that you have to write every single day and if you miss one day, you failed and you need to beat yourself up about it. That is not it at all. Personally, when I say every day, I mean not Sundays, for example, but it is most days. I would like you to be able to say that you write on more days than you don't write. Once you create a daily writing habit, you'll start to find that it just becomes second nature to write every day and you won't constantly have to get over the hump of motivating yourself to sit down and start writing. Many writers find that once they've established a writing habit, they actually find themselves getting jittery if they miss too many days in a row. I certainly find that. I start to feel really weird if I haven't written for a couple of weeks. Doing it for short periods regularly is far more effective than having shorter binges, in my opinion, always with the caveat that I'm sure somebody else will find it different. But uh, in my experience and in the experience of what people have told me who are successful writers, um, it's more reliable. Uh, so when you're starting out, it's about habits and being a writer, i.e. someone who writes. So if you are able to commit two hours per day, Monday to Friday, fabulous, you're on to a winner. But for most of us, that is going to be out of the question in your schedule. And there's no need to feel bad about that. Most of us can't find that sort of time when we're starting out. So what I would suggest is try to commit to at least 15 minutes of writing at least five days a week. If you can do that, then you have the foundations of a habit and you will find it much easier to build up from there. And soon you will find that you're doing half an hour a day or an hour a day and your story will be at the front of your mind. Um, another piece of advice on that is that it's very tempting to get swept away by your enthusiasm and try to commit to too much. I strongly advise against this. Don't try to commit to two hours a day, five days a week if you're not going to be able to, because you're far more likely to burn out after only a few weeks. And then you'll be so demoralized, you will fall back to no writing at all. So don't be a hero, be a writer. The next uh, tip under not enough time is to stick to a consistent schedule. Part of finding time to write and creating this habit is having a particular time when you write. Rather than starting each day not knowing when you're going to get your 15 minutes and then finding yourself exhausted at the end of the day with no writing done and no time left. There's a reason we brush our teeth first thing in the morning and last thing at night. These are easy to remember times which don't easily get derailed by other plans. So I think it's a good idea to try to apply the same consistent schedule to your writing time. Personally, I like to write first thing in the morning after I have brushed my teeth and done my meditation. I find that my mind is still nice and clear and not that cluttered by the business of the day. And it's much harder to get derailed by unexpected things that might come up in your day. Uh, however, other good times to write might be on your lunch break, on your commute, straight after you get home from work or right after dinner. 
It doesn't really matter when it is, just that you're able to do it regularly. Speaking of which, my next point is about having a safe space for writing and protecting it fiercely. Um, this is because this is part of creating a habit. Finding a safe space for writing can be the hardest for many people because of external pressures and constraints. And much of this may simply not be possible in your situation. And that, if that's the case, that is okay. But having a consistent place for writing can help your body get into the right mindset quicker in a sort of Pavlovian response. Um, having a safe space is really most important if one of the reasons you struggle to write is because you are constantly being interrupted in order to meet other people's demands. Uh, if this sounds familiar, uh, then when, when you'd like to be writing, you instead find yourself making sandwiches or finding shoes, then this is for you. This won't apply to all of you, but if that's the case, bear with me for the sake of those it does apply to. If at all possible, find a room that you can write in and close the door. This is much more important than you might think. It tells people I cannot be disturbed in a way that leaving the door open does not. Furthermore, tell everyone in your house that this is your writing time and you will be unavailable until 30 minutes or however long it is, is over. Tell them that if they have anything they need in that time, they must wait and not bother you unless the house is literally burning down and you need to be strong. If they ignore you and come in asking where the hole punch is, then you need to send them away until the time is up. Close the door, lock it if possible. Which brings me to my final point relating to finding time for writing. Don't apologize for taking time for writing. Again, I have spoken to a lot of writers and aspiring writers, and I very often hear them say, oh, I just feel like I should be doing this or that for someone else, and it's selfish taking this time uh, for writing. Uh, and if you did recognize yourselves in what I just said uh, about sh shutting the door and are feeling very uncomfortable and squirmy at the thought of doing that, then uh, this is particularly for you. Uh, and I would put it to you that the more uncomfortable that makes you feel, the more important it is for you to do it. Of course, some of the most rewarding things we can do in life is care for our friends and family, but this must be balanced with caring for ourselves. And this means doing things we find fulfilling just for us. So I often liken it to putting on your own oxygen mask first on the plane. There's a reason the flight attendants insist you put on yours before a child's, because if you don't make sure you're okay, there's a good chance that you won't be there for the people who need you. So I genuinely believe that insisting that your dreams have value and deserve to be respected and nurtured will make you better able to be there for, for your loved ones. Uh, not to mention modeling for them how to nurture their own dreams as adults. Okay, enough pep talk. Let's talk about distractions. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, our best friend and our worst enemy. Uh, so we've covered relationship-based distractions in the previous section. So this time I'm going to focus on distractions of the modern world. The internet is both the best and the worst thing to ha have happened to writers. On the one hand, we have access to research and information beyond our wildest dreams. On the other hand, there are massive corporations with huge resources at their disposal out there committed to grabbing our attention and holding on to it for as long as possible. And they all have direct access to our eyes through the internet. Just general Wikipedia style research rabbit holes can be bad enough for swallowing up your precious writing time. But when it comes to social media, you are really up against it. Doing research on the fly can be useful and if you're disciplined enough to find just what you're looking for and then get back to writing, then that's fine. However, if you find that once you start looking up some historical detail, you don't get back to the page for three hours, you need a better technique. And the technique I would suggest is time boxing. Uh, so time boxing means uh, laying out uh, what you're going to do on what specific hour. 
Uh, so you need to decide whether a particular writing time is dedicated to drafting or editing or research. All of those things are important. It's not always just about getting more words on the page. Uh, so when you have your writing time, set some si time aside for research so that you know that you will be able to do that. Um, and when you're in your drafting time box, if you realize you need to research something, make a note either in the manuscript itself or on a separate list, then refer back to these notes and lists when you're in your research time box. Uh, time boxing is extremely powerful, uh, especially if you can actually stick to it. Uh, the other suggestion I have for trying to combat uh, the distraction of in the social media and the internet is distraction blocker apps. Um, I highly recommend taking advantage of technology to help in your uh, fight against technology controlling you. Uh, so many phones have focus mode features built in. Uh, and if not, you can get apps such as uh, one of the leading ones is called Freedom, uh, where you can set periods where you are locked out of specific apps or you can set entire schedules uh, for limiting access to specific apps or to the internet as a whole. And I just find that taking the willpower out of it makes a huge difference. Then you're, it's not, you can't get easily distracted because you think, oh, I'll just check Twitter. You try and it says, no, you can't get back to writing. And then you do. Uh, so take advantage of the technology is my advice. Okay, uh, so... Sorry, I'm just, um, I don't think you need uh, the slides. They're just the title slides. Okay, so uh, the next roadblock is not knowing how to do something. So creative pursuits often come with a fallacy that people are born with it. Or on the other side of the coin, which I find more harmful, is that some people simply don't have it. Uh, it's my belief that while you can certainly be born with some genetic advantages, the difference those make are negligible compared to the hard work and dedication that's required to become a successful author. Just like learning how to build a house out of logs or do open heart surgery, it is 90% graft. So if you don't know how to do something when it comes to writing, don't assume you're just no good at coming up with characters or don't have the instinct for foreshadowing. Just be willing to identify your weak spot and get better. So there are various ways to improve your writing craft, and these are my favorites. Uh, uh, actually, I can show you a slide for this one, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so analyze the masters. Uh, in other words, your favorite authors. Uh, I don't mean that you have to analyze uh, Shakespeare. I think if, you're, if your favorite author is Colleen Hoover, then Colleen Hoover is the person that you should be analyzing. Uh, see how the masters do it by reading great novels in your genre and analyzing what the author has done and exactly how they've done it on a chapter, scene, paragraph and sentence level. If uh, you read a romance and you felt like your heart was torn out of your chest, find out how that was done. Why did you have that reaction? Look at the, what the author has done and you will become able to do the same thing to your readers. Uh, I also am a fan of formal courses and craft books. Uh, there's a lot to be learned from people who are willing to share what they have analyzed and learned. However, you do have to bear in mind that there are a lot of different opinions and techniques out there, and you can get pretty bogged down uh, with contradictory advice uh, and, and, um, and opinions on what makes a great story or a good story. And I would be particularly wary of anyone who says their way is the only way. The best way is whatever works for you as an individual. So I would say, read some books, go on some uh, courses, but don't go too far down that rabbit hole. You've got to, uh, and you can only learn so much from them. You will learn the most from writing, but you can learn a lot from there. Uh, and finally, writing communities are a really great way to draw on the knowledge of other people who are interested in the same things as you. Um, you can ask questions, you can get feedback on your work, 
and perfect the skills you need to. And they will help you find uh, weaknesses in your writing that you might not have known. And they will help you find solutions to weaknesses that you do know about or be able to answer questions where you're just stuck. Um, so people in writing often talk about perseverance as the most important factor in success. While I do agree that perseverance is critical, I don't think it's enough. I think it must be paired with continual improvement. If you do have both of those things, then it is just a matter of time. Roadblock five, perfectionism. The perfect is the enemy of the good. There are a lot of people who never finish their first novel because they get stuck trying to get the first few chapters just right. In my opinion, this is a huge mistake. Uh, stop playing a minute. Um, my advice for first drafts is to plow through and don't look back. That's because you learn so much about your story during the first draft. And it's very common to get to the end and want to entirely rewrite your opening chapters. Uh, for my book, Blood of Gods and Girls, I probably rewrote the opening about 16 times. Different versions, different versions of the same idea, completely different ideas. Uh, and it was, you know, I just couldn't have known what was going to happen until I got to the end, until I really pinned down the heart of the story. And then, then I knew how to start the story. So don't get stuck on the opening chapters trying to make them perfect. Um, so yeah, if you spent six months perfecting every sentence of the beginning, uh, then you, it's just wasted because you might end up scrapping the lot. Um, but worse than the wasted time uh, is the problem I mentioned earlier, which is that you get stuck in that quicksand of not wanting to continue until what you've got is great and then never getting to the end at all. And if you never get to the end, you haven't, you know, then the beginning is not going to do you any good. Um, so one of my favorite quotes is by Shannon Hale, which is when I'm writing my first draft, I remind myself that I'm just shoveling sand so that later I can build sandcastles. So that just beautifully sums it up for me. You need to get all of those words in there, just shove them in any old how. And once you have them there, then you can really start to craft them into something beautiful. But if you never get all your sand together, you can't build anything. So if you're writing your first draft, don't worry about getting it right, only worry about getting it finished. Roadblock six, fear of failure. This is a big one and it never really goes away. I've spoken to plenty of successfully published novelists who still worry that their next book will be a flop and that they'll never get another book deal. When you're starting out, that feeling is very strong because you haven't had any external validation to say that you are doing okay. So I have two suggestions for this. The first is to find small ways to confirm that you are on the right track. And the second is to reconfirm to yourself why you're writing in the first place. Uh, so the first thing is to try and get external validation. Um, so finding small ways to reassure yourself can come from a few different places. The first place I'd probably start would be with peer groups, such as in-person or online writing groups. Sharing your work with them and hearing what they say can be very helpful to highlight what your strengths as a writer are. And writing groups should always be encouraging, not demoralizing. By that, I'm not saying that writing groups are mutual back patting exercises, far from it. The feedback should be constructive, but it does need to focus on your strengths as well as making suggestions for areas of improvement. If your writing group buddies tell you they really liked something about your work, make sure you focus on that and savor it and internalize it because we have a tendency to rush off the things that people say that are good and just hone in and focus on the things where they say that there's a negative. And it's really important to try to be aware of that tendency that we have and enjoy the positive comments and believe them. Uh, another uh, place you can get feedback is from creative writing teachers. Again, take their feedback seriously and don't dismiss anything positive they say. 
Each positive comment is a little brick in your tower of success. And if they say they like something, they will mean it. And the third place, uh, when you feel ready, um, it, it, fantastic way to get external validation. In my personal experience, uh, to prove you're on the right track is with competitions. Uh, I entered competitions throughout my writing experience and I experienced a steady change from never getting anywhere to sometimes being long listed to being shortlisted to being a finalist. And it was, you know, it wasn't, it was up and down, but it just, every time I got a little further, it was proof that I was on the right track and it really gave me something to cling to when I still got other rejections. And uh, yeah, the last place to get external validation that I want to mention um, is personalized rejections. And that is if you are um, applying to agents, which not everybody will be, um, uh, but I guess the same for uh, indie publishers um, and other related things. Um, so if you are getting any personalized responses, even as rejections, these are actually extremely valuable. And the reason I mention this in particular is because I've heard many writers kind of grumpily dismiss these positive rejections as they are still rejections. So what's the difference? But a personal email from an agent is a big deal. They don't have time to do it. They basically gain nothing from it. So if they do, it means that your work really did stand out for them. Uh, it's probably that they see you as a talent that isn't quite there yet, but they believe you could get there and they want you to feel positive about them when you write your breakthrough novel. If they can see your potential, then you should believe in it too. Okay, on to the other side of uh, dealing with lack of self-belief and fear of failure is to remember the spark of joy. So about a year before my breakthrough, I had been very close and it had all looked like it was going to happen for me. I was getting shortlisted for awards. I was being, you know, a finalist and then nothing. Lots of agents said they thought I was a great writer and that my novel was wonderful and that somebody was going to snap me up, but it wasn't going to be them. And I have to tell you that being so close and then still not being able to take that final step was absolutely crushing. And it was the lowest I've ever felt during my writing career. I always told myself that if I wasn't good enough, I would just keep getting better until I was. But when that happened, it was the first time I really questioned whether I had it in me. So I took a step back and did some deep soul searching. I asked myself whether if I knew I was never going to be published for certain, would I still keep writing? And I forced myself to really answer that honestly. And I am pleased to say that the answer was yes. And I realized I just really enjoyed the process of writing and the creativity of building characters and stories. I remembered the reason that I started doing this in the first place. And it was because it brought me pleasure. So remembering my love of writing helped me stop focusing on specific goals. I still kept pursuing them, but I could do it with a lighter heart because my happiness didn't entirely depend on it. And I think that is fantastic armor against fear of failure. Okay, on to roadblock seven, intimidation around publishing. So of course, a lot of our fear of failure and lack of self-belief is fed by intimidation around the publishing industry. So the publishing industry is famously opaque, even those within it say so, which means a lot of misinformation and rumors spring up to fill the gap in information. It also makes it feel a lot less penetrable as it's hard to see where the doors are, let alone how to get through the locks and know all the secret passwords. So the good news is, that while competition is higher than ever, the playing field is also more level than ever. There is still a long way to go, uh, but there is more awareness of diversity and genuine attempts to make the industry more representative and fairer to all types of people. So if you want to, um, uh, yes, if you want to overcome the fear, uh, the best way in my view is to arm yourself with knowledge. Um, and that will help you avoid the worst pitfalls. Learning about the industry is an ongoing job. 
but I'm going to give you a few, few places just to get you started. Um, so, and some of them are listed on the slide there. So the Jane Friedman website is a fantastic resource. Um, all kinds of elements about the publishing industry. Uh, one of the leading websites out there, highly recommend it. I also recommend joining Facebook community groups and genre organizations. So many popular genres have organizations, either international or uh, in your country, to represent writers of those genres. So SCBWI, I've listed there, also known as Scooby, is the children's one. So I joined that um, when I was trying to figure out what I was doing, and I found that incredibly helpful. Um, and of course, it, as well as being helpful for information, it helps you build up your network, your community, and those are the people that are really going to give you a lot more information as well. Uh, uh, if you want to see behind the curtain when it comes to the actual process of publishing after you get a book deal, then I highly recommend the Publishing Rodeo podcast. Uh, their strapline is something like they say out loud the things that the publishing industry doesn't want you to or something like that. Um, and it's the story of two authors who got publishing deals with the same uh, publisher in the same year and had vastly different experiences. And it's gripping. <laughs> Um, you can also learn a lot by following the leading industry publications. In the UK, that would be the bookseller. In the US, I would say it's probably Publishers Marketplace, although I'm not the expert on the US. Um, if you're not UK or US based, your country may well have their own industry standard. But if not, you can do worse than accessing one of those. Neither of them are completely free. Um, I think they will give you some information free and then you have to pay if you want to read everything. Um, but they will uh, help you get familiar with trends in the industry and who the different players are and just to give you the armor and the tools that you need to navigate. Um, and of course, the key thing to remember now is that traditional publishing is not the only route to get uh, your books into your readers' hands and hearts. In the previous section, I touched on remembering what motivates you to write in the first place. Keeping that at the front of your mind can be really instructive when thinking about publishing. For some people, a traditional publishing book deal is the dream. They want to see their books on the shelves of Waterstones, of Barnes and Noble, and nothing else is the same. Other people just want their stories to be read. They want to know that they're touching people's lives. Others want to make a living from writing, a stable, reasonable income based on the words they produce. So when it comes to getting your books out there, traditional publishing is only one way, and independent publishing is a really great option, which many writers find preferable to traditional publishing in many ways. For one thing, traditional publishing is very slow. It can take up to two years for your book to be published after you get a book deal. Another issue is that you lose some creative control and your baby starts being raised by the publisher rather than by your hands only. And importantly, there's no guarantee that a traditional book deal will provide you with enough money to live on. The majority of traditional book deals are in the tens of thousands for several books. That's not enough to make a living when it takes quite a while to write a book. So if any of that is off-putting, it is worth considering self-publishing. It's by no means an easy option either. You still have to write excellent books. You have to put in the effort with learning about your industry and how to make it work for you. But it does make it easier to get your book out into the world faster. You retain creative control. And if your book is a hit and successful, you're not sharing your profits with the publisher. And of course, plenty of successful self-published books go on to get traditional book deals. So it can be used as a stepping stone in that way. If you are uh, going the self-publishing route, then you really need to understand the importance of presentation. Despite the old saying, people absolutely do judge a book by its cover, and that is how they're going to judge yours. So if you are uh, looking at designing a cover, make sure you use a reputable company to give you a professional looking cover, proper typesetting inside, good quality paper if you're printing, Otherwise, your novel will fall at the first hurdle, even if it's a masterpiece. Uh, and I do want to say that BookBaby are one of the best companies out there for providing professional expert resources, support and services. And I highly recommend their services. 
Uh, but maybe we'll uh, a bit later say a little more about how they can guide you through some of these hurdles or over some of these hurdles um, and the services they provide, such as editing and cover design. Uh, and if you are going to self-publish, I can't stress enough how important it is to get these things done properly and not cut corners. Otherwise, you will be shooting yourself in the foot before we start. Okay, moving on to roadblock eight, wanting to switch projects. I am sure many of you are familiar with the desire to change projects halfway through. This is closely related to some of the other points on this list of roadblocks, including distractions, perfectionism, fear, fear of failure, and what we're going to talk about next, which is pushing through the hard bits. As writers, we tend to have more than one idea burning in our minds and souls at any one time. There may be some people who can work on more than one project at the same time, but for most of us, the fact is we need to pick one of our story ideas and then focus on that until it's done which is all very well, until we get to what's sometimes called the messy middle. This is the point at which the energy you had from the novelty of the new story is starting to wane and you're realizing all the ways in which the story is full of snarls. You have to write the scenes that aren't as fun as your favorite scenes, but still need to be written in order for the story to make sense. Your characters aren't jumping off the page how you were hoping, it's all getting a bit sticky. Suddenly, it seems very attractive to start working on something else. It's not like we failed, right? Because we're still writing in any way. We're not thinking about horrible things like failure because we're distracted by this shiny new novel, which still has all its potential completely unsullied. Now, it has to be said that there are times when it is skillful to change novels rather than just doggedly pushing on when uh, things uh, are right. But far more often, the desire to change projects is born from a desire to escape the pain of dealing with this hard, messy middle. And you know what's going to happen then? Once you get to the messy middle of your shiny new project, you'll want to switch again. And that way you'll end up with a lot of half finished manuscripts. My suggestion for getting through this hard bit is not to just bang your head against it, but to make a plan. Rather than abandoning the whole book, you need to get over the hump. And my recommendation for doing that is to break the hump into smaller pieces until each is easy to step over. I recommend making a list of everything you need to do. Write down each scene that needs writing or editing, every plot thread that needs checking, every character that needs fleshing out, every way you know you need line edits or bits of research completing. Organize this list into quick wins, big jobs, and medium jobs. Then with each of, within each of those sections, number each of the tasks. Then go through each task in order, starting with the quick wins for a sense of achievement and to get your momentum going, then do, deal with the big jobs, and finally complete the middle ones. By breaking things down into pieces like this, you can eat the elephant piece by piece and focus on what's in front of you rather than becoming paralyzed by the scale of the job. Okay, I'll quickly do roadblock nine because we're gonna run out of time for questions. <laughs> um, so final roadblock, pushing through the hard bits. This is really a recap of uh, what most of what we've done uh, earlier because there are many hard parts of writing a novel. You might become physically or emotionally drained from the effort. You might get thrown off course by a life emergency that takes you away from writing. You might discover you've written a plot hole from which you see no escape. You might have a sudden attack of imposter syndrome and convince yourself you were an idiot to think this was something you should ever do. Uh, so a summary of tools and tips to help you push through to the end. Make a plan. I'm a big fan of making a plan. Uh, and I'm a big fan of breaking things down into smaller manageable tasks rather than just being paralyzed by the scale of things. Do it through habit. Once you can establish that habit and you're putting in the hours, even if it feels like you're not getting very far, you will be making progress. Tiny bit of progress every day. Eventually you will break through and things will start to flow again. Believe in yourself. Imposter syndrome is the natural space for writers. Be afraid and do it anyway. And always keep learning. 
Read, reading a chapter of a book about craft or analyzing a chapter of your favorite book can often jumpstart your brain and give you new inspiration for something you're stuck on in your story. And most importantly, never forget why you started writing in the first place. Keep that flame alive and don't let the pursuit of publication suffocate it or sales. Stay connected with the joy of storytelling. So those are my top tips for overcoming some of the most common roadblocks to writing a novel. I really hope you found some useful nuggets in there. I mentioned the Novel Factory a couple of times. Uh, I really do believe that one of the best ways to overcome roadblocks is to have the right tools, which is why I created the Novel Factory for my own use. Uh, so I'm just going to take one minute to show you some of its key features. Uh, and then Ramona's going to take a minute to explain a little bit about how Book Baby can help you get published. And then we're going to go straight to questions and I'll keep this as brief as possible. Uh, so... Um, in the Novel Factory, there is a whole section dedicated to your characters where you can add characters in a single click. And each character comes with a vast range of optional question sheets that you can pick through to prompt ideas about how your character is. It also has a plot manager, uh, which is like a cork board where you can keep your index cards with your plot outline. This helps you brainstorm ideas. Uh, and allows you to keep a changeable plot structure, freeing you from being uh, paralyzed by getting everything down uh, perfectly from the beginning. And this is key for uh, overcoming the roadblock of the structure and getting started. Uh, it includes templates for a bunch of different popular genres. This is a perfect way to get over that initial hurdle. Uh, and each of these templates is broken down into different uh, beats. And if you choose one, then it generates plot cards with each of these beats explained to tell you what sort of thing your audience is going to be expecting from that part of the novel. And finally, the manuscript section. Personally, I like a clean, simple interface when I'm writing. So I designed the novel factory, novel factory to be uncluttered and also quite customizable. So you can hide or show sidebars to see your notes uh, and see list and all that sort of thing. Um, being able to easily move around your novel and quickly access related information can help you stay in the flow writing state and avoid tripping over and losing your momentum. So enough about the Novel Factory. If you'd like to know more about it, of course, you can access our website. You can try it free for 30 days. Now I am going to hand over to Ramona, um, who can give us a brief overview of how Book Baby can help you get published. Thank you, Katya. Um, so one thing I forgot to mention early on, or just to summarize, is Book Baby offers professional print and publishing services and we're located in southern New Jersey, right across the bridge from Philadelphia, but we work with people across the globe. So it doesn't matter where you are in the U.S., if you're in the U.K., if you're in Australia or somewhere else, we can still work with you, help you print, publish, or offer other services. Like she was saying, all these wonderful tips, the, you know, the nine points of everything you need to consider um, before you even get started and as you're working on your manuscript. Once you get to the point where you're finished with it, Book Baby offers you know, a wide variety of services so that self-publishing doesn't have to have that stigma. You know, you can, they'll, they'll judge your book by its cover, but also from all the pages inside, and we offer cover design, typesetting. But for editing, we offer proofreading, um, where we're doing a general overview. We do something more intensive for nonfiction's copy editing, which is a word-by-word -word mechanical edit and looking at sentence structure, still the other services you get with proofreading. And we do line editing, which is a bit more intensive for, not, for fiction, where it's looking at character development, plotting, pacing, more. Developmental, I saw someone had mentioned that. We don't offer that service, but that is the next step, I would say, even beyond line editing, where you can really probably work with an editor one-on-one -on -one and flesh it out even further than, you know, what you would get with just, you know, looking over character development. They're really going to work with you to restructure your entire manuscript. So um, those are things to consider. And then for even people who might not be ready to go the independent route just yet, we actually have a service to help you um, edit your query letter. I know how important that is. That is the, the key.
key to get through that door for traditional publishing. So if you all um, are at that point where you've taken all of Katya's advice, finished your manuscripts, you know, you've gotten that editing and now you're ready to present it to an agent and possibly get one, then uh, we can help you edit your query letter as well. Uh, so those are, those are just some of the services that, that BookBaby offers. A lot of people were saying that they had worked with us before. So I encourage you to go to our site, bookbaby.com. We have a lot of free guides and one of them is five steps to self-publishing. So you can learn a lot more um, than the time I have here to explain it. Oh, we can't hear you, Katya. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ramona. Um, that's really helpful. And yes, yeah, so we'll look at some questions now. I'm just gonna look in the Q&A. Um, okay, at the end of the presentation, can you summarize the nine writing block points? Uh, I can't. I don't have a slide with all of them on, I don't think, but I can tell you what they were. Um, so the first one is getting started. How do you start writing the novel? Uh, then there is time, not having enough time. The third one was distractions. How do you deal with the many distractions of the modern world? Then we had not knowing how to do something, feeling like you're stuck because you don't know how to. Perfectionism, that's a big roadblock for lots of people. Uh, then lack of uh, self-belief or fear of failure, intimidation, in, ooh, intimidation around publishing, wanting to switch projects, and then finally pushing through the hard bits. So I hope that helps. Um, okay. Uh, I sorry, it's quite a long one. Um, I find planning more of a distraction for me and keeps me from writing. However, I was in the middle of rewrites on my novel and making changes, and then it made me worry I was messing things up or that I wouldn't be able to tie these new lines in properly. Then I got so bogged down mentally that I haven't worked on the novel for over a year. Not quite sure where to go from here. Perhaps planning now that I will have the book written will help me sort it out. Um, yeah, fear focusing too much on the planning again. Um, any suggestions? So my suggestion, um, would be definitely to um, just not worry that you are messing things up or you won't be able to tie in the new lines um, because, because I think that's just a normal part of it, that you will feel that way. I know I certainly have that where I'm, it feels like you're pulling out one thread and the entire thing is just going to unravel. So you just have to trust that you need to make these changes and then you will go back and you will uh, edit them on the next draft. I also think focusing on drafts would be really useful if you understand that you are making these changes in this draft. It's not going to be perfect, but that's OK, because then you're going to take a few weeks away then you're going to come back and you're going to start again. And in that time, a lot of other things will become clear. Um, and yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, in your question about um, things that I've touched on, like fear, um, you know, it, I, you just have to like be afraid and do it anyway. And just remember that you love the writing and don't worry about the end product too much. I hope some of that's helpful. I don't know if Ramona, you have anything to add to that? Not to that specifically, no. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, question. Would you discuss the different types of editing, the difference between line editing, proofreading, developmental editing, content editing? That sounds like it might be one for you. Yeah, I feel like I, I answered um, ah. that initially, but um, I saw a lot of people asking also about marketing services. That's jumping a little bit ahead, but I don't mind answering some of that. Um, for Book Baby, we do offer marketing services. We offer social media ad campaigns. Um, and so you would have to have a published, published book first. Um, so that's a farther down the line. But once you have a published book, whether it's traditional or independent, if you're even working with your publisher to promote the book even more, you can do that. Or if you've independently published and you want to still give it a boost, then uh, you can choose a social media platform. There's many different ways to approach it. And so if you really are interested in that service, I would encourage calling Book Baby's main line so you can speak with a rep because uh, each project is unique. And so if you have a specific idea, they can help you flesh out the best way to tackle that and, and do your marketing. 
Okay, um, so we are actually at seven um, now. So uh, if anybody needs to go, obviously feel free to go, that's fine. Um, I'm okay to stay for a few more minutes. So you're okay to stay for a few more minutes, Ramona? Yeah, I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll just do like five more minutes of questions because there are quite a few and I'll try to be um, quick. <laughs> um, okay, so, okay, does an old factory work with Mac Apple? Yes. It does, it's cross-platform and you can do it in a browser or in an app. Where are resources or websites for finding an agent? There are lots. The one that I will mention now is Query Tracker. Um, is it Query? Huh? Yeah, it's Query Tracker, that's right. Um, Because there, there's two elements of it now, isn't there? <laughs> um, yeah. So I think, anyway, so it's Query Tracker. And I, personally, I think this is the best resource. It's free, you can get a premium version, but the basic version is free. Uh, it's really well updated. Um, it's got lists of almost every active agent on there. You can get loads of information about them. You can see um, how long they take to open uh, their submissions, all that kind of thing. So there are lots of places, but Query Tracker is the is the key one that I would point you to. Um, I actually see one. Um, so Sydney was asking about editing, but asking if you need all of them or one of the many. So usually you want to get uh, more of an intensive edit for the first time, especially if this is your rough draft. Obviously, confide in your writing groups, get beta readers, but you really want to polish that full manuscript. And then after you integrate the feedback from the larger manuscript, whether it's from like line editing or developmental editing, you still probably want to go back and do proofreading um, just to make sure that it's as polished as possible. Um, so first step is more intensive. Second step is a lot lighter. So that's what I would recommend. Okay. Um, okay, there's another one. Hi, I live outside the US, but would like to publish there. I write sci-fi short stories and I'm making a collection of short stories and novellas for a book. Can I work with Book Baby to publish and promote my collection? Yes, you can. Like I said, we work with people across the globe. So it doesn't matter where you are, we can still help you publish and we distribute globally as well. Okay. Um, right. Understanding there are many out there. Where did you find which competitions did you enter? Interested specifically in YA sci-fi fantasy. So because I was so into competitions, I uh, ended up making a list because I couldn't find a decent list of novel writing competitions. So if you go to our website and look under, I think it's under resources, we have a list of every credible competition uh, that we could find internationally um, for novel writing. So there are lots of short story competitions, flash fiction, poetry, those are not on there. We only specify in novel writing competitions, but if there's a decent one in the world somewhere, it should be on that list. Um, so I would highly recommend going and looking at that list. And we give a load of information so that you can glance through and some of them will say, well, we, we explain eligibility of the author and of the book. So if you have to be based in Yorkshire, it will say there so you can see that before you, you know, go down and look any further. OK, there are a lot more questions. I'm so sorry we haven't had time to answer more of them. Um, but yeah, please do get in touch. Um, if you want to email me, you can do that at info at novel-software.com. Um, if I haven't answered your question, uh, then and I will I will get back to you and answer that. I don't know if Ramona, you want to tell us a, the website or an email yes, address. You can actually reach out to us at info at bookbaby.com. And that's a simple way. We have a lot of support there um, that can answer your questions. And then, you know, if you're serious about moving forward, you can work with a specialist one on one. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really hope you found it useful and informative. And I really wish you so much uh, of the best in getting over all of those challenges because they are really hard, um, but it can be so worthwhile and so satisfying if you can manage to do it. Um, so yes, get in touch with us if you want to. And also, yes, if you have any feedback, not, uh, other than questions, if you have feedback on this webinar, um, we would love to hear it. Um, it's always nice to hear if it's been helpful and it's also useful to hear if there's something else you would have liked to, to hear us cover that we could in incorporate next time. So until next time, happy writing. <laughs>